Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Whoa, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. All these pieces broken and scattered And mercy gathered, mended and home Empty-handed but not forsaken I've been set free, I've been set free Oh, amazing grace Sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Whoa, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love. your treasure in jars of clay so take this heart lord i'll be your vessel the world to see your life in me It's a tough day, um, but on behalf of Beverly Shablick, who Dexter always called Gigi, and that's how I'm going to refer to her for the rest of this hour, and the Randolph family, I want to extend a warm thank you for being here. Your presence is evidence of your love and support for Gigi, Kim, Shavlik, Senna, Kenny, Dean, and Barry. And we're here today to express our love for them and to mourn with them and to give them comfort in their time of incomprehensible loss and unimaginable heartache. The death of a loved one, particularly someone as young as Dexter, will leave a lasting pain in their hearts. To say otherwise would be untrue. Death is painful. But let me also say this. 
one of the reasons that God sent His Son into this world was and still is to comfort those who are hurting. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The reason Jesus came into this world was to conquer both sin and death and to show us the path that leads to life, peace, joy, and heaven. On Tuesday, I had the privilege of meeting with Senna in my office, and it was a very special time with her. I shared with her a story from the Bible that is similar to what... Dave, do I need to slide back a little bit? I shared with her a story from the Bible that's similar to what she's going through. It's a story of Martha and Mary who lost their brother, Lazarus, who, who just happened to be one of Jesus' best friends. They lived in a town called Bethany, and Jesus went there often just to be with His friends and to, to rest. And we, when Jesus came to the visitation for Lazarus, He looked at Mary and He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live, even though He dies. And whoever believes in Me will never die. Then He looked at her and He said, do you believe this? And that's a question I want to ask you all today. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, You are the creator and sustainer of the universe. In Your image, You created each one of us. And You love every one of us more than we can even imagine. Your original plan for this world did not include death. But we've all rebelled against You. Thus, death has become a part of life. You know and understand the pain of death more than anyone else because not only did You lose Your one and only Son, but you've witnessed the ravages of death throughout all of history. Jesus, you even experienced the pain and suffering of this life for us so that you can actually identify with us. The prophet writes about your suffering in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, where he writes, He, speaking of Jesus, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Your word tells us that you, O Lord, are our sympathetic high priest and that you sympathize with our weaknesses and sufferings and pain. Furthermore, you invite us to approach your throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, this is a great time of need. We lift up to you this special family, all their loved ones and friends who are hurting today because of this untimely death. The Bible says you're the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. You promise to comfort us in our trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the same comfort we ourselves have received from You. Lord, many come here today perhaps angry, certainly confused, and all of us have questions. We have no way else to turn but to You and Your Word. Hear our prayer. Comfort Dexter's family in their loss. Give them answers to their questions. Give them faith to press on. Give them hope in the midst of pain. And God, all of us, as we make our way through this often difficult life and bring us to the end of our lives, safe and secure in you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Gigi, would you like to come up? Can you hear me? Am I, am I too loud? <laughs> that wouldn't be unusual. Uh, on behalf of Dexter and our entire family, we thank you all for being here. You'll be told that a thousand times today, but we know it's out of love and respect, and I thank you so much. We all do. I never envisioned that this is how I would be celebrating his life, and I don't think any of us are, and I don't think any of us are ready for something like this. But we know that God has a plan for all of us, and his plan will always be perfect if you just let it be. Sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes we're angry. Sometimes we grieve and grieve and grieve. But don't do that because that negates everything he stood for. I would ask you, please, I challenge each one of you, today,
to learn from this. Learn that patience and understanding, forgiveness, loving, all of it, that's what I challenge each one to do because it's just going to make us all better. We live in a sort of scuttlebutt world now. I um, will say that my granddaughter, Dexter's sister, always said to me, Gigi, if you knew him, if you met him, you lo knew him and you loved him. And that's just how he was. So take comfort today in knowing that Dexter, I won't say, is in a better place, but in a wonderful place. A friend of ours once said to him a couple of years ago, you know, it's the darkest before the dawn. Think about that. It's the darkest before the dawn. And he is in the dawn now and loving every minute of it. So I thank you, and if you hear all the rumbling sometimes during the days after you've left here, you'll know it's Dexter, and he's already found a host of angels just clapping and jamming together. And he's looking down at all of us, and especially me. It's all right, Gigi. It's all right. Peace and love go with you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Gigi, I think you need to come up and finish the service. I mean, you did a, wow. That says it all right there. I don't really need to say anything else. Y'all probably going to rush you. Would you please step aside and let somebody else talk? But anyway, I'm honored that they would ask me to do this. Um, and I want to share some from God's Word. Because really, I don't have any answers. But the Bible does. And here's one. John 11:25. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus comforts his followers with these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. And then he said, you know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered a verse that you're all familiar with. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's made it very clear how we go to heaven. And it's through him. It's open to everybody in the world. When he was crucified, his, he was, his arms were stretched out like this, and all who will may come. That's an invitation to everyone. But God has said there's one way, but it's, a wide, it's wide open to everyone. I'd like for us to recite the Lord's Prayer together. Would you bow your heads with me? And it's in your bulletin if you want to see the version we're going to be using. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dale Moody, and I'm proud to tell you that Dexter was my best friend. When we graduated college, we all get the same briefing from the real world that lays out the rules of the game. We get a job, get nice things, stress is normal, care about what everyone thinks about you, maybe more than you care about yourself. And I signed up, like all of us did. And Dexter got the exact same sales pitch and immediately hit unsubscribe. <laughs> he was a larger than life character. I've never met anyone who knew Dexter and didn't love Dexter. He was such a pleasure to be around. For a nervous and anxious person like myself, having Dexter in my life was therapeutic. That big smile, his big Lebowski, it'll be all right attitude, would always bring me back to reality in trying times. We had a connection that didn't require words, 
and he was part of me, and he still is. You might think that I'm unfortunate to be in this position, speaking at my best friend's funeral. This is one of those extreme situations you never imagined that you'll be in. But I'm actually one of the luckiest people in the world, because even though our time was cut short together, I had the opportunity to experience the joy of having not one, but two soulmates, my beautiful wife, Stuart, and my best friend, also beautiful, Dexter. I'm left with countless memories and moments that were so Dex. I could go all day with them, but in the interest of time, we'll just use two. In 2011, we drove to Myrtle Beach to see the Trey Anastasio band. We took a stretch limousine, the two of us, five minutes from the hotel to the show. We had an awesome time, but we also really wanted McDonald's. So we left early, under the assumption that it's definitely about to be over. We woke up the next day and realized that we missed a four-song encore, including one of our absolute favorites called First Tube, and I was ticked off. But Dexter wasn't. His attitude was as usual, and his outlook was, well, we got to see the rest of the show, didn't we? And that's exactly why I needed him. Dexter and I would occasionally take trips to surf, just for the day, and days in advance, he would be so excited and so stoked, just shaking, thrilled, and eager to surf. So eager, in fact, that I'd pick him up and he'd fall asleep immediately for two hours <laughs> to the beach. So when we arrived on this occasion, he surfed a few waves, and he said he was going to the bathroom. About an hour later, wondering where he went, I walked up the sand dune and saw an unmistakable pair of legs hanging out of the back of my car. He had opened the lift gate and was taking a nap. <laughs> Never mind that he just had a two-hour nap the way down, on top of what was undoubtedly a full night of sleep before. <laughs> but that was Dex. He could sleep through anything. In fact, when I visited Kim and Gigi earlier this week, they told me that they've actually woken Dexter up in the morning before, only to find him back asleep in the shower. <laughs> six foot six or seven, just sleeping in a shower. <laughs> I don't know if I ever made it clear to Dexter how much I needed him, and I think he was under the impression that he needed me, but in reality, he had it backwards. I've looked up from, to him from the day I met him, and he really was my hero. But I'm finding peace in knowing that Dexter has all the answers now. He's up there jamming with Jimi Hendrix, Jerry Garcia, most likely living in a conky that also has a guitar section and a mattress factory. Dexter's true heaven. <laughs> There's only one, there's only room for one person like him in this world. So that means that somewhere out there, sometime soon, maybe today, another one of a kind like Dexter is being born. And I'm really hoping that I am lucky enough to cross paths with that person someday. And we're gonna play a song that Dexter loved by the Grateful Dead. It's called Deal. Um, there's a lot of interpretations of what it could mean, but for me it's about slowing down, appreciating everything that's around you, and not taking anything for granted. Since it costs a lot to win, and even more to lose, you and me bound to spend some time Wondering what to choose Goes to show you don't ever know So watch each card you play and play it slow Wait till that deal comes round Don't you let that deal go down, no, no
I've been gambling from here and bounce For ten good solid years If I told you about all that went down It would burn both your ears It goes to show you don't ever know Watch each card you play and play it slow Wait till that deal go down Don't you let that deal go down, no, no Goes to show you don't ever know to watch each card you play and play it slow. Don't let that deal go down. Don't you let that deal go down? Oh no. I'm Shavlik. This is Senna. Uh, I'm Dexter's brother. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to say is uh, really how much the love and support that everybody has given me and my family um, <coughs> has meant to me and my family. Obviously, this happened when I was in Japan, um, and just to he hearing the stories of, of people coming over to my house and 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 writing my mom and my grandmother and my dad um it it meant the world to me because i wasn't able to be back home and be able to take care of m my family the way i thought i sh should have been able to so i just want to let you know how appreciative that i am for every single one of you that's here um and uh to kind of go on what dale was saying um we used to call Dexter the Michael Jordan of taking naps um, and to 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 kind of a, a story to support that uh, yeah uh, he would he would sleep through he would sleep through this trust me he would sleep through um, one of my games when I was playing basketball in China he uh, he didn't come to a lot of them because he would always prefer to stay in the hotel or staying in the house and practice music. He didn't come to a lot of games, but one game he he did choose to come to for whatever reason. And they had a, the seat set up um, right courtside for friends and family, and he was sitting in one of those seats. And uh, <coughs> as with any game that I play in that I have friends or family come to, I want to make sure they get there and, the, and they're safe. and and so I don't have to worry about him before the game starts. So I saw Dexter arrive, saw him get go to his seat, and I was uh, obviously, you know, comfortable that he was there, he was okay. And <coughs> I go into the locker room for the pregame speech that the coach has to give us before the game, and our general manager rushes in and comes to me and and – starts yelling something in Chinese. Yeah, and I've lived in China for six years and still can't speak one word of Chinese, so I don't know what he was saying, but the translator said, uh, something's wrong with your brother. We're, you know, we're worried about it. So something's wrong with him. And so I ran outside, and he's sprawled out on the floor um, in his chair just taking a nap. He, <laughs> He was really just taking a nap. That's all he was doing. And I went and shoved him and got mad at him. He woke up and then opted to take the taxi back to uh, take the taxi back to the hotel to finish his nap, probably. Um, but uh, you know, I, I've had a lot of time to to reflect and to to think about a lot. Uh, you know, being in Japan for four to five days while all this happened, um, and you know, really the thing that that kind of comes to my mind is that is that we're all going to die someday, and and obviously this is a tragedy. Dexter dying is a tragedy, but um, you know, I got almost thirty years with with an amazing brother, and we all are going to die, and <coughs> we can't take 
anything with us when we die. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter any accomplishments you have. All that you can take are the memories and the, the way people feel about you and the love that people feel about you. And in the 30 years that we had, we made unbelievable memories. And, and obviously, as a sign of everyone being here, people loved him and and so that you know that's that's means so much to me and i just want to say thank you <clears throat> um try not to be repetitive first and foremost i want to thank everyone here on behalf of my family and everyone who couldn't make it um for the outpouring of love and support that you've given us. It has helped our grieving process be a little more manageable, if that's even possible. Um, in true Dexter fashion, I am going to fly by the seat of my pants talking to you guys today. Um, I didn't write anything down. I didn't take notes. I didn't really prepare in true Dexter form. Um, so bear with me. I also had Shavik tell me that if Dexter were here, they would make a bet on how long it would take me to cry. Um, so I'm going to try my best to try and win this one, but I don't think I'll be able to. Um, October 8, 2019 was the hardest day of my life. It didn't feel real then and it still doesn't feel real today. As Gigi mentioned, I was talking with my family and friends, and the first thing that could come to mind is I just said, if you met him, you knew him, you loved him. And it was just as simple as that. Anyone that knows me knows I called Dexter my little one, which is pretty funny considering I don't think anyone has ever considered a six 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 seven man little, but he was my little one. Dexter and I were five years apart, so it took us a little later on in life to become very, very close. Um, I always saw him as the nerdy little boy that was always in the way, or the one always trying to get me in trouble or telling on me. Um, I specifically remember when we had our beach house and we would go to spend the summers at the beach and spend all day out on the beach and Dexter would surf for hours and hours and then we would come inside later in the afternoon and typically I had friends with me and we would go swim in our next door neighbor's pool and my friends and I were trying to do our synchronized swimming or dance routines or diving off the diving board perfecting our dives who knows what but it'd be inevitable that Dexter up and down that pool with his scuba diving gear and would be trying to search for treasures. And I don't know what treasures he was looking for, but I was so embarrassed. And I remember I would yell to my mom and dad and say, can you get Dexter out of the pool? And they would always say, honey, he's not in your way. And I would say, and he wasn't, he was never in the way, but I think eventually he got dragged into a dance routine or became a judge of the diving contest. And still to this day, my friends call him scuba Dex. Um, as the years went on, I, I'm pretty sure when I was in high school, he wanted to avoid me. Um, I think he probably saw me as the typical crazy high school girl, always fighting with her mom about her curfew or what parties she could and could not go to or why I couldn't spend the night somewhere because parents weren't there. Um, and constantly being grounded for sneaking out. I... I'm pretty sure Dexter avoided me because I always tried to get him to lie to my parents for me. And he never wanted to. He never wanted to disappoint my mom or disappoint my dad or disappoint Gigi. Um, as the years went on, he went to high school. I went to college. We still didn't get very close until I graduated college. And I remember I moved to Atlanta. And I'm pretty sure it was Dexter's freshman year state, fall semester, and I was home visiting. I'm sure it was a football game. And I was at Crowley's with my friends, and I had probably a handful of people come up to me and ask me, are you Dexter Randolph's older sister? 
are you Dexter's older sister? And I remember thinking, what is happening right now? Like, that was not the question I was used to getting. And in my mind, I also was thinking, wait, is, is Dexter cool? Like, when did he become, when did Scuba Dex go to Sexy Dexy, as my friends started calling him? Um, he and I quickly became best friends. And he became one of my best friends. <laughs> the thing about brothers is you can tell them literally anything and not have to worry about them repeating it or telling a soul because probably three-fourths of the time they don't care what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Dexter would let me cry to him. He would let me vent to him. He would let me complain to him or be happy. Um, and I'm pretty sure three-fourths of the time he didn't care about the gossip that was happening with my friends at the time or the fight I was in with my boyfriend at the time or the outfit I was wearing to the next party. Um, but he always sat there and listened. And the one thing he always knew how to do was to make me laugh. And the thing about Dexter is he had one of those smiles that if he smiled, you couldn't help but smile. It was one of the most contagious smiles that I've ever known. Even so much so that I remember the night before his graduation from state, I was celebrating with him and his friends and celebrating a little too hard and Dexter fell and chipped his tooth and I think three-fourths of his tooth went missing. And I remember thinking to myself, mom and dad are gonna kill me um, because I was the older sister. I was supposed to protect him and be responsible for him. And I remember him looking at me and being like, you have to tell mom and dad. And I was like, okay. But it didn't matter because he showed up to graduation with that smile. And I'm specifically picturing this picture that's at Gigi's of Dexter getting his diploma with that big smile on his face and all you can see is his smile and you would never know that he had half a tooth missing. Um, fast forward to the more present day um, when Dexter would not be with Shav traveling the world with him and he would be in Raleigh. My favorite nights would be hanging out with Dexter. We would hang out. <laughs> for hours together. I would always try new recipes on him, which I don't know if it was a good or bad thing for me because no matter what I cooked, he always said it was the best thing ever. I'm pretty sure I could have put garbage in front of his face and he still would have said it was the best thing ever. We would watch The Office for hours. I think he and I both could quote The Office from start to finish all nine seasons. But it was inevitable when we would be hanging out that he would ask me if he could get his guitar and let me preface this by he had to ask me because I always wanted at least an hour with him so we could talk and we could catch up about what was going on in each other's lives at the time. But once he got his guitar, he couldn't stop playing. He loved, loved, loved his guitar. Sometimes he just even had to hold it. He didn't even have to be playing. He would just strum the chords. Um, he did throw me a bone every now and then. Once he would start playing for hours, I would go back to work emails or I would go start laundry or clean and we didn't even have to be talking. We were just together and every now and then I would hear him play a song that I would like and let me say, if you know me and you know Dexter, our taste in music is a little different. Um, his jam band style of music is kind of far scale from my teeny bopper pop style music. But he would always throw me a bone and play a Justin Bieber song. And I would get so excited and you would think I was actually at the concert and I can just picture him looking at me and being like, you are so ridiculous. And one of the our favorite songs that is one of my favorite songs and he would always play for me and we would actually sing it together. It's Tracks My Tears by Smokey Robinson. And I can't imagine if you were fly on the wall how good it sounded, but 
that song would forever remind me of Dexter. And he loved music so much. He would have changed the world with music if he could have. Um, I am going to finish by saying a couple of things that I want him to know. I am the luckiest person in the world to have been given the best younger brother and best older brother than anyone could ask for. The bonds we shared with each other were very special and unique and unbreakable. And when I say unbreakable, I mean unbreakable because trust me, there were some heated arguments over the years, but nothing was ever heated enough to where it would make our love waver for one another. The most special bond that we had was the one that we shared, all three of us, Shavlik, Dexter, and I. We were always the best version of ourselves when we all three were together. So Dexter, I want you to know that even though you're physically not here, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, it will always be the three of us. Being your big sister was one of the greatest joys of my life. I love you so, so much. And even though you're gone, you will forever and always be my little one. There are really no words that I can offer today to fill the void you have in your hearts. I wish I could. The death of a loved one always leaves a void and a pain that will never totally go away this side of heaven. Nor can I answer all the questions that we all probably have about life and death, particularly the why questions like, why God did you allow this? Why God is there so much suffering in the world? But what I do want to do is I want to I want to take us to the one source that I know has provided me comfort during my lifetime, and that is God's Word. Did you know the Bible contains over 8,000 promises? And I believe that God will be faithful to keep every one of them. So what I want to share with you in our remaining moments is just some of these promises. Yesterday, Kim reminded me that my oldest son, Rushman, chaperoned Dexter and some of his friends on a skiing trip, which I want to know what our definition of chaperone is. And so I actually called up Rushman, Kim, yesterday afternoon, and I said, Rushman, um, do you remember this trip that you took back in college, I guess it was, and you chaperoned Dexter and some of his friends to go on this skiing trip out west? And he said, yeah, I sure do. I said, what do you remember about Dexter? He said, he was just fun to be with. And he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. That's a direct quote. Chris and our boys had the privilege of growing up next to the Shavlicks as we had a condominium right there beside the Carl Bay Club, and they were next door in their house. And we spent a, a, a lot of time with Kenny and Kim and Shavlik and Dexter and, and Senna at our favorite place, Atlantic Beach. And um, my boys, we love to um, spend time in the ocean, boogie boarding, surfing. And every time we would go out there, Shavlik and Son and Dexter would come running out there with their boogie boards and surfboards. But you know, Dexter, well, Chrissy told me that Dexter was the one who was always sitting on the porch waiting and watching for the Andrews boys to show up. And then he would come running out there dragging this long surfboard that if you can believe it or not, it was longer than he was. He was 10 years old at the time. And I believe that when God looked down and saw these dads and their sons and daughter riding waves in the ocean, that he smiled. And he said, this is good. I believe God meant for our world to be just like this. A world full of joy and peace and light and laughter and life. But that's not the world we live in. This world is full of sin, sorrow, pain, suffering, and, and sadly, death. One of the things you learn when you're in ministry is people come to you with their difficulties. And I've never seen so many difficulties and, and hurts in people's lives. And Jesus told us this is the way it would be. In John 16, he said, I've told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He's the only hope that we have, folks. You see, in the beginning when God created this world, He warned us that if we rebelled against Him, we would die. And so the real reason that there's so much pain and suffering and death in the world is because of our rebellion against God. I know this is not necessarily what we want to hear, but it's important that we understand why 
hospitals are full of sick people and why these cemeteries are full of people. God told us how to live because He wanted us to be safe and experience nothing but joy. But as you all know, if you have a young child, we all want to do things our own way. Have you all learned that, particularly your grandparents with two and three-year-olds running around the house? You tell them not to do that, and what are they going to do? That's the first thing they're going to go do. I know I had two boys. Paul writes in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men, because all sin. And y'all, we're all cut from the same piece of cloth. We, we've all sinned. I'm the chief of sinners. Just ask my family. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to use Dexter's life to share three truths. And here's the first one. Life is short. Life is short for all of us. But Dexter's life was way too short. Dexter's favorite musician, Jimi Hendrix, once said, the story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. The story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again. I think Jimi Hendrix got it right. <laughs> Billy Graham was once asked, I remember I was watching television, this reporter asked him, you know, in all your years, what's the most amazing truth that you've ever learned about life? And with that, Betty and I, he said, the brevity of life. Life passes by so quickly. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James chapter 4, verse 14, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 39, verse 4, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. It seems like yesterday that I was at Camp Seagull, and here I am. <laughs> Can't you look back and see that it seems like a long time when you're passing through, but when you look back, we were a few days, a few days ago, it seemed like we were at college, and here we are. Life is short. Secondly, life is hard. As I've already said, Dexter loved life, but like scores of young people, he discovered that life is very difficult. I've, I've people come to me, as I said all the time, who are struggling with life. I've struggled with life. And listen, there's nothing wrong with struggling. In fact, struggling is the norm. This is why Jesus said, in this world you will have what? Somebody tell me. Trouble. I know that many of you who come today are struggling. Many of you have found life overwhelming. And so what I'd like to do is I would like to try to offer some answers from God's Word. And to do so, I want to go back to John chapter 11 where Jesus finds himself standing in a cemetery just like we are today. And his friend Lazarus has been dead for four days. And so I pick up with John chapter 11, verse 33, where John writes, When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Let me pause for just a minute. That phrase there in the Greek means to snort with anger like a horse pawing at the ground. You wouldn't pick that up from the English. Jesus was angry. Why was he angry? I think it had more to do than just Lazarus' death. I think when he looked at that tomb, he was looking through the tunnels of time, and he saw all the cemeteries in the world full of people who had died, and he was angry because this is not the world that his father planned. I believe that God hates death, and this is why Jesus was so angry. And then Jesus asked, Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? Jesus loves Dexter. He loves everyone here. And if, if you leave with one truth today, you take this truth with you. G God loves you more than you can imagine. More than we even love our children, which is hard for me to fathom. So, they, so Jesus went over to the tomb. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. And Martha answered him, But Lord, he has been dead for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Someone said if he hadn't used Lazarus' name and said, come out, that everybody would have come out. I don't know if that's true or not, but it makes sense. And it says, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And then Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I believe that's a true story. 
Gigi, Shavlet, Kim, Senna, Kenny, Dean, Barry. I know that the Lord knows your pain and sorrow. I have no doubt of it. I believe he's right here in our midst. Because the Bible says that with two or three gathering his name, he's there also. And we're gathered here. Just look at this cemetery. It's full of crosses. Why is that? Because with the cross in a cemetery, he's basically saying, I have conquered death. That's why we put crosses on tombstones. And I know that you probably have had some anger. Nothing wrong with that. God understands. He's angry too over death. And I want to tell everyone here, I know that God cares and I know that he understands. But maybe some of you aren't sure of this. And that's okay. I just want to personalize this for you and I, I don't want to sound preachy. Dexter would not want me to sound preachy. I haven't lost a child and I can't imagine anything worse. And I hope I never do. I hope none of you ever do. I'm sure that the Randolphs hope you never do. But I've experienced pain and confusion in my life. My father struggled with life and buried his pain in a bottle. It even led to my parents' divorce. And so what did I do with my pain and suffering and even some anger? Is I went to Jesus because my mother told me about him. And I prayed to my heavenly father that he would help my earthly father. And as a young teenager, I began to read God's word and I felt Jesus become my friend and my comforter. I can't explain it to you if you haven't experienced it, but it's real. I can tell you that Jesus is real. He's not a figment of my imagination. And I wish I could sit down with each one of you and share how the Lord healed the pain of my sorrow, particularly when my father died too young. And he's continued to help me through this often difficult life. I know people look out you know, at Facebook and Instagram and think everybody's got it together, but we don't. Everyone here, I guarantee you, is going through some kind of trouble or difficulty. Or you know somebody who is. And if you haven't experienced difficulty, just keep on living. 2 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. He does. And when you have issues, troubles, run to Jesus. That's what I do. I go into my office and shut the door sometimes and lock it so nobody come in and I just get down on my knees and ask God to help me. Life is short. Life is hard. God is good. And because of His goodness, He offers us hope through His Son, Jesus, who died and was raised again on the third day. And listen, only Jesus can offer hope to this world. And that hope lies in the resurrection. Listen, without the resurrection, there would be no hope. So you have to decide if you think the resurrection really happened. I do. And I could give you countless reasons, but now's not the time for that. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 15, 20 and 21, this is the Apostle Paul who once was a hater of Christians. Now he's the Apostle who was chosen by Jesus to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first, Because he saw him on the road to Damascus. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, the Son of God. Jesus is the, name, Jesus is the Savior of the world. When I was a young boy, my mother shared the gospel with me and I placed my trust in Jesus. Now, when I went off to school, I kind of stuck that on the back burner. But um, if you'd stopped me in Chapel Hill after about 18 beers, I'd have told you about Jesus if you'd asked me. Nobody ever asked me. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, as a young boy, I thought, well, I know I don't want to perish, whatever that is. This thing called eternal life, I think I want that. And so as a simple child, I just believed. And that's what Jesus says. Unless you come with the faith of a child, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. You see, the moment you place your trust, y'all know another uh, Holy Spirit and wind come from a Greek word, the same Greek word. A little wind blowing through here. You can read in that whatever you want to. <laughs> the moment you place your trust in Jesus, John 3.16 says you have eternal life. It's a, in the, it's a present tense verb. You have it. And guess what? When you have it, you can never lose it. You can't. When God chooses you to be one of His children, you're His. He doesn't make mistakes. And you can rest assured that when the resurrection occurs at the end of the world, you'll be raised up in a new body, 
I could go into that, but I don't have time <laughs> to live with the Lord forever in a place the Bible calls heaven. He also describes it as paradise. This is the hope that followers of Jesus cling to as we go through this difficult life. This is what you have to cling to, this hope that you have. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain with Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He is our anchor. One of my favorite scenes in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Didn't you see that, Shabley? Um, Kim told me it's one of your favorite movies, but anyway. I don't know if y'all saw The Passion of the Christ. It's a very difficult movie. The last 12 hours of Jesus, I couldn't watch it again. I had to cover my eyes during part of it. But my favorite scene in that movie is when Jesus is literally, if you imagine this is about a 10-foot cross, he's carrying this thing over his shoulder. He's just been scourged by uh, Roman soldiers within inches of his life and crown, uh, you're crowned with a crown of thorns and beaten with rods and spit upon and cursed. And he's, he's literally near the point of death. That's why his, his, his time on the cross didn't last that long. He was so close to death. But in, this, in the movie, he's walking along this path and the crowds are like this on both sides. And the, the camera span, um, looks over to the right and you can see his mother Mary tracking along with him. And all of a sudden he stumbles to the ground, literally exhausted. And his face is just inches from the dirt. And Mary comes running out. And in that moment, the movie flashes back to when Jesus was about 10 years old. And they, we don't know this from Scripture, but Mel Gibson was just taking some liberty, which I got no problem with. Because it probably happened. Jesus is... 10 years old and he's coming back home and he's running along a little path and he stumbles and, the, and Mary goes up and scoops him up. Don't you know that Mary wanted to scoop her son up when he was 33 carrying that cross? And so they're down on the ground together. Literally their faces are six inches apart. And Jesus looks at her. He says, Mother, don't you see? I'm making all things new. And then he looks up towards the hill with renewed determination, and he goes to his destination. That's why Jesus came into the world for one reason, to die on that cross. <coughs> the disciple John, who was um, one of the twelve, looks like he was Jesus' best friend of the disciples. Remember, he was on the cross. He said, John, take care of my mother. Even while he was dying, Jesus was thinking about his mother. And John, unlike... Uh, 11 of the other disciples was not martyred. He was exiled to Patmos, which was a island prison. I've actually been there, so it does exist. It's actually a beautiful island in the Aegean Sea. Um, but back then, it was a, you wouldn't want to go there. It's kind of like Papillon if you've seen that movie. But while John is there, Jesus appears to him and says, John, I want you to, this is in Revelation chapter 1, I want you to write down everything that I show you. And then he began to show him the future. That's what the book of Revelation is. It's a series of dreams and visions that Jesus gave to John. And he wrote them down. And one of those visions is found in Revelation chapter 21. And it's a vision of what God has in plan for the world, which is a new world. And so I want you to hear what John wrote and what he saw. He says, and you have to remember, this, there's some symbolism in this, so you can't take it literally. But he's, he writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. By the way, that word new there, it means restored. This earth is not going to be destroyed. It's going to be renewed. Don't you all think there's some beautiful places in this world? <laughs> there are. There are a glimpse of God's original creation. But he's going to restore it and make it like brand new. That's what John has seen. He's seen the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now I want you all to catch this. John could not describe what he was seeing. He couldn't describe what would be there. So he tells us what will not be there. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, This is Jesus. I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, John, for these words are trustworthy and true. One of the things I've learned since the days of my mother sharing the gospel with me 
If God says it, you can count on it. God has planned a new world. He's going to usher in a new kingdom. This is the hope to which I'm clinging to. And I hope you are as well. One day, I believe that Jesus is going to look out over the world and He's going to shout, not Lazarus, but He's just going to say the words, come out. And that will be the resurrection. And everyone who has placed their trust in Jesus will rise to everlasting life. These words are trustworthy and true. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. I pray to God that You would take Your Word and just penetrate our minds and hearts and draw us into an eternal, lasting relationship with You. The kind of relationship that You design us to have. A relationship with our Heavenly Father. I'll just lift up the, the Randolph family and Gigi. Watch over them, Lord. Give them Your strength. Help them to cling to You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. People say I'm the life of the party guys. I tell a joke and soon. Although I might be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside I'm blue. So take a good look at my face. You see that smile looks out of place As you get closer, it's easy to trace The tracks of my ideas oh. Since you left me, if you see me with another girl Seeming like I'm having fun Although she may be cute, she's just a substitute Because you're, you're the perfect one So take a good look at my face You see that smile looks out of place As you get closer, it's easy to trace the tracks of my eyes, the earth. Oh.